very much wet. My nose is. Okay. Good. This one, is this one even on? Good morning, everybody. I think we could do a better job than that. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it's so good to see you all. Welcome, and welcome to anybody who's online that's um, signing in to worship with us today. I just have a couple little reminders that I'd like to bring to your attention. Today, after service, we are having cookie hour down in the basement and also today is our annual business meeting so make sure you're around for that to be able to see everything that's going on and who's being voted into what positions and things like that I also wanted to just let you know and just so the ladies are aware that there is a um, women's Bible study that is on Monday it's here in the office at 6.30, and that is going on this next week, because I believe it got canceled a little bit ago, right? For the holidays. So that's back up and going. So just so you're aware, ladies, that that is going on. And I believe that's all the announcements I actually have for today, which is amazing that I think I got them all. <laughs> So with that being said, I, I'm going to ask, will you please um, stand with me as I open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for everything you have given to us. We thank you for this ability just to be here together, to fellowship, to worship you. Father, I just pray that you will open our hearts, our minds, and our souls to you today so that we can be transformed and grow closer in our relationship with you in some way, Father. We love you, we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can be seated for right now. I wanted to share with you, um, on Thanksgiving Day, you guys are aware of the fact that we had a call that our grandson had fallen in the pool and possibly drowned. That was a horrifying day for us. This was the first picture we received of Paul when he was in the hospital. God provided a fire chief who was experienced that jumped right in to help with life saving and get a helicopter there. But I, and as a congregation, you guys have prayed and prayed and prayed for my grandson. And I'll have to say that this whole experience has taught me what prayer is all about. Share, we will pray for you. We have a prayer team in this church. But go ahead, this is where we're at today. Come get me, big boy. I'm gonna get you. 
I'm gonna get you. Dude. Go. Come on. Go. His butt's actually under. Yay, buddy. And he has just been transferred to a rehab center. They say that for what he has gone through, even the physical therapy people say they have not seen one come back so fast and so well. They think he'll be there one to two weeks, possibly be able to go home. But thank you, thank you, thank you for praying for our grandson because God has delivered. Okay, uh, Philippians 2.9. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place. Uh, am I on the wrong one? Okay, Psalm 138. Excuse me. May all the kings of the earth praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is on high, he looks upon the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar.
Corinthians 2.9. Therefore, Therefore God, God exalted him to the highest place and gave, and gave him the name that is above every name.
come here for the children's story. Remember what the first verse in the Bible is? Adam and Eve. Hmm? Adam and Eve. That's the first people in the Bible. That's pretty good. I see a hand back there. Yeah, that's you. Right. So it all started out with God creating the heavens and the earth. And then he made Adam and Eve. Now, where did Adam and Eve live at first? Yes. In the Garden of Eden. Right on. So they lived in the Garden of Eden. Where was the Garden of Eden? Can you show it to me on the map? It's a trick question. Because there was a global flood that changed the earth so much, there's no way anyone can tell where the Garden of Eden was. But Adam and Eve had everything just their way in the Garden of Eden. There was no sin, no problems. They never even thought of doing anything bad, except God made one rule. Don't learn about evil. Don't. Don't eat from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But they were people just like us, and they just up and ate from that tree. And God kicked them out. And now, instead of having one rule that said, don't eat from that tree, now they had to have all kinds of rules to keep them from doing things that they think about that were bad. And the problem is, is they got lots of people on the earth. They started getting worse and worse. And they were cheating each other and beating each other up and killing each other and lying to each other. It was pretty terrible. It wasn't what God had planned for people to, be, for people to behave. So God said, enough is enough, and he sent a flood all over the whole earth, and it changed the topography of the earth. In other words, what the earth looks like. See, before the flood, the mountains weren't very high, and there weren't very, the oceans weren't very big. But when the flood came, there were the fountains, the great deep were opened up. That's the way, the way it says in the Bible. That was volcanoes. Those volcanoes spewed out uh, ash and lava, which made the rocks, and it spewed out steam. And then that steam came back on the earth, covered the whole earth. Well, God had then needed to get some dry land so he caused huge earthquakes. And the mountains came up, and there's fossil sea life on the tops of mountains. Like Mount Everest has fossil clams clear up on the top. There's fossil clams and other sea life in the Rocky Mountains up high and in the Andes Mountains down in South America. God left a, a changed earth that we could look at and see the things that were the results of the flood. You know, we think about why would God use a flood to kill all the bad people? Well, he wanted people to remember that he doesn't like sin. And so he used a flood which left such a big marks all across the earth 
that if people just look, they will see proof of it. You know, we can trust what the Bible says, and we can look and see the evidence of the flood. And we're out of time for children's stories, so you can go with your leaders. for communion. Matthew 4, 19. Then he, he said, said to them, them Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their, their nets and followed him. Good morning. Somebody asked this morning, how's retirement going? And I'm going, <laughs> so a little update on that. It's been only been two years and six months and 13 days <laughs> since my last real job. So I thought it might be to have some lighthearted facts about being retired. And this is, uh, see how many people you know the answers to some of this. And uh, I think I just lost my paper on that. Let me look over here real quick. <laughs> well, part of it is missing memory. One of them is, is how many retirees does it take to change a light bulb? Does anybody know? <laughs> Only one, but it might take all day. <laughs> and uh, what is considered to be proper attire for a, a retiree? Tied shoes. <laughs> Anyway, there's, there's some more other jokes. I don't know where that piece of paper went. It's probably here, and I just missed it. And sometimes I get a little bit nervous. Oh, there's one of them. Uh, why do retirees like my, mine being called seniors? Anybody know? Discount. Discount, a 10% discount. That's right. That's an old one. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, you know, um, yesterday I was asked to provide a sound system for the McCabe funeral in the Ion Cemetery. And uh, there are a few things that I dislike more than having to set up a sound system in a hurry, being rushed or being behind. And it's a formula for having things to go wrong, I swear. So I always like to eat there real early and be set up and just wait. I'd rather be there two hours early and wait for an hour than uh, be there scrambling to get stuff together. 
Well, I ended up with an hour of time to kill, and it seems there's no better way to see the reality of the, and the mortality of our life than to wander around and read tombstones. <laughs> Some of the graves, there must have been the settlers that came over in a wagon train. I um, mean, it's, it's really interesting to read. Well, you know, before I came to Hepner, I used to attend Orchards Community Church in Lewiston, Idaho, and there the pastor, Mark Brewster, he was always, a ca always had captivating sermons and uh, using a number of life illustrations and scripture to illustrate his points. But last June, he made a post on Facebook, which was really a bit captivating, and it always made me, made his point with some interesting comments, which I would like to share with you. He says, um, page two. <laughs> he says, when I went to church, I saw something very interesting and uh, really made an impression on my heart. When I got up there, the pastor went up to his uh, pulpit to preach, and there were eight stacks of boxes, and each stack had five boxes high. Four stacks on each side of the podium, and 40 boxes in all. He went on to explain that each box represented two years of a person's life, a person's life meaning that 40 boxes pictured a lifespan of about 80 years. He was quick to acknowledge that some people's lives have more than 40 boxes and others have less. Exactly one week before, I had, been, I had celebrated my 68th birthday. And so I stared at the scene at the platform that morning and thought that the thought that wouldn't escape, escape my mind was, I only have six boxes left. Now, I fully realize that I might not have, might not live to the age of 80. And I also know that I could live, well, maybe beyond 80. The boxes are merely an il illustration, but my point is, relatively speaking, I don't have many boxes left. And that thought does not discourage me it, or depress me. It challenges me. You see, I was diagnosed with bone marrow cancer multiple myeloma in 40% of my cells were cancerous. Myeloma is very difficult cancer to, to diagnose, diagnose early. If it would have gone undetected too long, the only box that I would have had left for me would have been the one they buried me in. By God's grace, it was discovered soon enough to be immediately treated with chemo. And by God's grace, my body responded well to that treatment. After a few months of chemo, on June 1st, 2016, exactly six years ago today, I was in complete remission, and by God's grace, I'm still there. Glory to God. Whether I have six boxes left, or more than six, or less than six, no worries. I've learned that the number of boxes we're given are not as important as what we do with the boxes we're given. An interesting fact that Pastor Mark Brewster and I are only two years apart. And uh, so we're kind of counting boxes together. And as I look around, I suppose we probably all are keeping an eye on them. But again, the reality of that is that the number of, that we have, it's not the number that we have, but rather what we do with what we have. And this morning, I would challenge you that anyone that challenges you that only the thing that can really count is what we, is our walk with Christ and how we serve him. That's what our boxes need to be filled with. You know, um, there's a scripture, Isaiah 33, 6 says, he'll be the sure foundation of your time, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that we can be in your house this morning. We thank you for providing a clear way of salvation. We thank you for the time, this time of remembrance of your shed blood and body as we partake in this communion. In thy name, amen.
morning. As you all know, we've been continuing to go through Exodus, and we're going through the story of how God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, and we're going to continue to go through this story as he brings them out of Egypt into the desert, creates the old covenant with them, and, and ultimately brings them to the promised land. There's a lot that we can learn throughout this story, this large story of the Israelite people, and a lot that we can apply. And I found a story that I, I, it's a short story, but I found it quite interesting. It's from Today in the World, and it tells how in February 1980, the U.S. Olympic hockey team, they slipped its foot into a glass slipper and walked away with a gold medal at Lake Placid, New York. See, those collegians had shocked the world by upsetting the powerful Soviet team. And then they grabbed the championship from Finland while the crowd chanted, USA, USA. See, before his team's victory over the Soviet Union, though, which advanced them to the finals, the coach of the U.S. hockey team told his players, something really important. He said, you are born to be a player. You are meant to be here at this time. This is your moment. Now open with this short story because I just love the words of the coach to his team. He provided exactly what they needed in order to succeed. And they did. See, in a much greater sense, God provides everything you need to execute his will. Much like the coach in this story shared with his teammates that they needed the encouragement to move forward to victory, God does the same with us. He provides us with everything we need. And that's why today, as we look at the life of Moses, we will see just how far God will go to provide us with what we need. So if you haven't already, would you please turn with me to Exodus chapter 3. We're going to be starting in verse 1. It's Exodus chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Now God's word reads, Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Hor Horeb. How do you say that? Horeb. Horeb. Am I saying that right? I'm going to have a few words that I might bumble here. Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight. Why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals for your feet, or from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel have come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. 
So if we were to just stop right there for a moment, we are given our first key point for today, which is that God reveals himself and he calls Moses to serve. This is important for us to see because throughout this revelation and this call to service, a few interesting things are shown to us that God reveals to us about his nature. First, we see that yet again, God is showing us that that he is not far off and distant, not by any means. The Lord has heard the cries and the suffering of his people. Therefore, he spurs into action in order to deliver them from Pharaoh and bring them into the promised land that he had promised Abraham all those many years ago. So God reveals himself to Moses through a burning bush in order to use Moses to execute his will for his people. See, this is great news. Great news for us. Because if we can, if God can choose a man like Moses, well, there's hope that he can use us as well. Right? You see, Moses was a murderer who is now wandering in the desert up until this point in his life. However, what do we see? Well, we see that God reveals himself and calls Moses to serve. Through this interaction, God is showing us his redemptive power as he takes a sinner like Moses and and raises him up for great service. And the good news is that, that God, through Jesus Christ, is still doing this same thing today within our own lives as well. D.L. Moody wrote the following words next to Isaiah 6, 8 in his Bible. He said, I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. What I can do, I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. See, Isaiah 6, 8 tells us, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. You see, in the same way that that Moody understood Isaiah 6, 8, likewise, we all need to have a willing heart to be sent and used by the Lord when he calls us. Let me kind of restate that. We need to have a willing heart to be sent and used by the Lord when he calls us. Doesn't mean, oh, I'm not available today, Lord. I I got things I got to get done first. No, when he calls us, we need to be willing to serve. It doesn't matter that, that we're imperfect sinners like Moses. God can and will use us if we are willing to submit to his will and let him lead us. So that through the power of Christ, we can all serve our purpose, because we do all have a purpose in in spreading the good news of redemption and salvation that is now available and offered to all. Secondly, though, through this encounter Moses has with the Lord, we also learn that God is holy. Therefore, when we interact with God, he should always be given the highest reverence we can possibly give. We even talked about this a little bit in Sunday school today. Realizing who God is and giving him the the honor and the authority that he deserves. Moses is told to not come any further and that the ground is holy. See, God even makes the ground holy when his presence is there. Moses then, after realizing exactly who God is, he he hides his face because he's afraid to look upon the Lord. See, this is a great example of the reverence we all should have regarding the Lord. Rod Cooper once said, now whether we eat, whether we drink, whether we play, whether we work, all of it is to be done in the presence of God and for his glory. See, we are a people who are constantly to be available to him. Therefore, if we have no worship on Monday, no 
worship on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday, how can we expect to have worship with God on Sunday? All we've done is attended church. Worshiping the Lord with true reverence and fear is a result of being available to him on a daily basis. Understanding he deserves it all. When we come to him in prayer, when we come to commune with God, when we worship the Lord, we need to remember to come to him with respect that is full of fear and reverence. For God is holy. And he alone is deserving of such respect from us. And, and brothers and sisters, I'm not meaning to harp on anybody, but we do a poor job of remembering God is holy. We, we oftentimes get so caught up with life, right? What I need to get done, instead of taking the time to remember who God is and saying, God, what do you want me to do? It's okay to take a breather and the American culture is horrible at this. We're a go, 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 go society. Other people across the world, time doesn't mean the same thing that it means to us. So as our culture is around us, we have to remember to take the time to stop, worship God, remember he's holy, and answer his call. Continuing on, in our reading, we need to pick back up, starting in verse 11, which reads, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, this you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. Go and gather the elders of the Israelites together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me saying, I am indeed concerned about you and what has been done to you in Egypt. So I said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of the Egyptians to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites to the land flowing with milk and honey. They will pray, or they will pay heed to what you say. And you, with the elders of Israel, will come to the king of Egypt, and you will say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So now please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go, except under compulsion. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I shall do in the midst of it. And after that, he will let you go. I will grant this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be that when you go, you will not go empty-handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor and the woman who lives in her house articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing, and you will put them on your sons and daughters. Thus you will plunder the Egyptians. See, now there's a lot of information going, given to us here. However, if we were to boil it all down, we come to the second key point for today, which is that God provides comfort and reassurance. This is where things change in Moses' interaction with the Lord. Moses, who is now afraid and, and feeling quite inadequate, asks, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? 
Moses doesn't feel worthy and is completely trying to get out of his calling. But can, can we really blame him? Remember, Moses is an outcast from his people and a wanted murderer in Egypt. It's easy to see how anyone would be hesitant to return back to that place. However, God rebuttals Moses and provides comfort by saying that that Moses will not be going alone. God himself will be with him. What comfort, what reassurance that should have been there for Moses. But yet again, Moses lets fear grip him, in which we see that he, he questions God a second time. Moses is now worried that the people won't even believe him and they are going to want proof, some type of proof. So, so God, again, provides comfort and reassurance to Moses. God does this through giving his name, I am, as proof, as well as providing his entire war plan. Did you catch that in all the details? God said exactly what's going to happen down to the very fact that in the end, they will plunder all of Egypt as they leave. God reveals all the details to show that he is in complete and utter control of the situation. Pharaoh's nothing to God. Moses need not fear. For, the, for God, the great I am will be with him, and he has the winning plan. God wants Moses to take the leap of faith and place his life into God's more than capable hands. God provides comfort and reassurance so that Moses can fully execute God's will. The great news is, is God provides comfort and reassurance for you and I as well. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. God is with all of us who have Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. He has a plan, and he has executed it perfectly through Christ. We are saved. And the great part is God is, he's even revealed the ending. And it's a great ending. God, as well as all of us, his adopted children, we win. I like being on the winning team. I was even reminded of that as we were watching our Kyla. She was playing basketball. And it got kind of heated there because we were down by a couple. And then we tied it, 12 to 12. And right at the end, someone got fouled on our team and she shot that one shot and it went in so now we're up by one and we had seconds to go and the joy when the buzzer went off and and the the winning joy we should have the same type of joy when our football we see our football team wins when it comes to living for god because we win we've already won But oftentimes, aren't we walking around like we've lost the battle? Right? We need to not hang our heads low. We should should be a light in this world that when people see us walking, that they go, why are you so happy in this world? Well, because I'm on the winning team. I'm saved because of Jesus Christ. And when he comes back again, he's going to fix all of this. That should be where our heart is. Therefore, we should not let fear grip our souls. Instead, we must faithfully execute Jesus' will as we wait for his glorious return. A.W. Tozer once said, God is looking for people through whom he can do the impossible. What a pity that we plan only the things that we can do by ourselves. Don't be afraid to let the Lord use you in this life. Be bold 
to submit to his power and let him lead you to share the truth of the gospel with all the boldness you possibly can. For you are not alone just as Moses was not alone. The Lord is with you and he is providing you with everything you need for his glory to shine out. Moving forward, however, we come to see that God is not quite done providing yet. Picking back up in chapter 4, starting in verse 1, it reads, Then Moses said, What if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say, The Lord has not appeared to you. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hands? And he said, A staff. Then he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. But the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. So he stretched out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. The Lord furthermore said to him, Now put your hand into your bosom. So he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then he said, put your hand into your bosom again. So he put his hand into his bosom again, and when he took it out of his bosom, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you or heed the witness of the first sign, they may believe the witness of the last sign. But if they will not believe even these two signs or heed what you say, then you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the ground. And the water which you take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. Then Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past nor since. You have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. The Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him utter or mute or deaf, or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. See, the third key point for today is that God empowers Moses. Just look at the extent God goes to. Moses, yet for a third time, tries to reject God's calling. I do find it quite funny that in verse 10, Moses says that he's not eloquent in speaking and is slow of tongue. Yet this whole entire time, he has been quick to speak, elegant in trying to weasel his way out of things with God. He was also a prince in Egypt at one point. Royalty has to know how to speak. God, who's well aware of all of Moses' abilities, was of course quick to put Moses in his place. But beyond that point, what do we see God doing, we see that he is empowering Moses. If words will not work on the people, then God through his spirit is going to work miracles through Moses. Did you know that God has empowered us as his people as well? In Acts chapter 1 verses 7 through 8, Jesus himself said, It is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. We all have the Holy Spirit living within us. Those who accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, you have the Holy Spirit of God living within you. And if that is not empowerment... I frankly don't know what is. For it is through the Holy Spirit that the church has spread across the world, has it not? It is through the Holy Spirit that 
that we as God's people are able to reject the schemes of the enemy. And it's through the Holy Spirit that the church has been playing its part in God's plan to free the captives of the world so that they can come and know Jesus as their Lord and Savior as well and be empowered by his spirit. Just as God provided for Moses by empowering him to free the Israelites from slavery, he has also empowered each and every one of us so that we can execute his perfect will by seeking the lost and enslaved of this world, breaking their chains through the power of Christ and watching them walk into salvation. That's a powerful thing. That's a life-changing thing. God has empowered us. However, the story's not quite finished. Continuing on to verse 13, we have just a few more verses to look at for today. Verse 13 reads, But he said, Please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you will. Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses, and he said, Is there not your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently, and moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You are to speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and his mouth, and I will teach you what you are to do. Moreover, He shall speak for you to the people, and he will be as a mouth for you, and you will be a mouth for you, and you will be as God to him. You shall take in your hand this staff with which you shall perform the signs. Now, the final key point for today is that God silences Moses. Now, this last point may seem kind of insignificant compared to all the others. You know, God providing comfort, his power, his strength, all those other things. This may seem very insignificant. However, in reality, I think it's one of the most powerful because of its implications. You see, Moses arrogantly forgot who he was interacting with. In which he goes as far as to tell God to basically choose someone else in verse 13. That's what that phrase that he starts with is referring to. God, just send whoever you will. God's already said who he wants to send, but he's like, God, go ahead. Pick someone else. It's at this point that God has had enough. In which we see in verse 14 that an interesting moment takes place. It says, Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. I wouldn't want to be Moses in that moment. You know, sometimes we as people need to be reminded who God is. And if we are all being honest, sometimes we need to be humbled before the Lord just like Moses was. For God is the one and only true God and creator of all existence. He took something out of nothing and created everything. He alone is holy and worthy to be praised and respected above all else. It will serve us all well to remember this about who God is and choose to humble ourselves instead of pushing God to have to do it for us. Could you imagine having the burning anger of the Lord against you? Sadly, there's been a few times I think he was pushing some anger towards me to get me to do what he wanted me to be doing. I often make the joke, I mean, God often times has to take two two by four to my head. It would do us well to humble ourselves before the Lord so that he doesn't have to do it for us. You see, we as people have this great ability to become big-headed and arrogant. Do we not? 
I'm guilty of it. I definitely know that. And if we're all being honest, I think we can agree on that, that we as people have this great ability to become big-headed and arrogant, in which in these moments we forget to recognize God. See, Job had a moment in which God humbled him. And after God humbled him, he submitted. King Nebuchadnezzar had plenty of moments in which God humbled him. And even King Nebuchadnezzar recognized God after that. And sadly here, Moses has a similar moment. All Moses was focused on was trying to weasel his way out of his calling, in which, because of that arrogance, God's loving correction had to be applied to his life. Moses failed to understand what a privilege it is to be called and used by the living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So here we see that God silences Moses with a rebuke in which Moses at this time finally gets the point and he humbly embraces his role in God's plan. We'll even see that later on. You know how God was saying, okay, Aaron will speak for you. That happens for a little while and then Moses steps in and he starts speaking for God to Pharaoh and mightily. But what is really great about this moment in which God silenced Moses is the fact that in the process, God is helping Moses to grow and change in his character. Moses has been humbled and is now ready to obey the Lord. So instead of God having to humble us, instead, let's deflate our own heads. Let's lay our own arrogance down and choose to humble ourselves before the Lord. That way, like Moses, we also can be ready to obey the Lord whenever he calls. Charles Spurgeon once told the story of his grandfather James and his faith in God. He had a large family and a very small income. But his He loved the Lord, and he would not have given up his preaching of the gospel for anything. One day, the cow on which the family relied for milk for the children suddenly died. James Spurgeon's wife was greatly concerned, but he said, God said he would provide, and I believe he could send us 50 cows if he pleased. On that same day, a group met in London, a group James Spurgeon didn't know that that wanted to help meet the needs of poor pastors. They raised a large sum of money and, and began sending it to different pastors in need all over to help their families. When they reached the end of the list, there were still five pounds left. One man suggested sending it to James Spurgeon. Another said, No, let's not send just five pounds. Let me add five more to go with it. Others joined in, and the day after his cow died, James Spurgeon received 20 pounds in the mail. You see, you can trust God to keep his promises and provide for your needs. As it says in Philippians 4.19, But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in the glory by Christ Jesus. See, the story I just read about James Spurgeon is a modern time story that perfectly helps reveal the heart of what Moses in the burning bush points us to. You see, the fact is God provides everything you need to execute his will. God provided for Moses by revealing himself and selecting Moses for service. God provided for Moses by giving him comfort and reassurance. God provided for Moses by empowering him. And finally, God provided for Moses through humbling him into silence. This entire interaction prepared Moses to faithfully execute God's will in freeing his people. 
So whatever it is that the Lord is calling you to do for his kingdom, never forget that, that just like with Moses and for James Spurgeon, God provides everything you need to execute his will as well. The real question is, are you going to humbly accept the call and let the Lord provide for you? Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this section of Moses' life story. We thank you for revealing your very nature to us, Lord. The fact that we don't need to worry. You are in complete control. Father, we just thank you for that. I pray and ask that you would help us all to be humble before you so that you can use us for your will and for your service, Father. Help us to accept what you want for our lives. Help us not go down the route that Moses did, arguing with you about every little detail and everything. You have already given us the road map, your word, God, that shows us we're empowered by you. You are taking care of us, and you already won. And because of that, we win as well because of Jesus. Help us be bold in this world, Father. Help us to be diligent in following and serving you. In your loving name we pray. Amen. So at this time, the praise team, if you would start making your way forward. <coughs> I get the great privilege, and it really is a privilege, to just give you an invitation. Now, there's two invitations that I, I want to offer. Thank you. The first one is for you who may be sitting in the pews that have not given your life over to the Lord yet. He loves you. He wants you to be in his family, and he wants to save you from your sin, save you from death. He wants to empower you with his spirit, and he wants to use you for service. If you haven't made that decision and you're sitting in the pews today and you would like to make that decision, just come forward anytime during this song. We can easily, we got cookies and things going on. I can get a baptismal filled up pretty quick. We can, and we would love to, as the church, usher you into the family of God. But the other decision that needs to be made is where might God be able to use you? We often don't hear that enough in church. Where can you serve? There's plenty of ways you can contact me, any of the elders. We have all sorts of places that you can get plugged in and start serving. There's ways outside these doors, out in the world. How can God use you? Ask him and make a decision to let him use you. Will you please stand as we sing this song?
cheated. We got some trivia. Moses' father-in-law was also called what? <laughs> Jethro. Jethro. Last week, what was his other name that he went by? Raul. What did Moses do when he was afraid to look upon God? Hid his face. Yeah, he hid his face, and I think that was a wise decision. What did God call himself when speaking to Moses? I am. I am that I am. Short ones. We all did well on that one. All right, I got some praises and some prayer concerns here. Um, Jocelyn has a praise that um, her mom is doing better after the cortisone shot. Is that, is that correct? Yep. So she got a cortisone shot and she is doing better. So that is a praise. Praise the Lord. Also prayer, um, McKaylee. Um, Okay, from McKaylee about Whitley. Okay. Um, Whitley went to her doctor, had her heart monitor showing signs of her heart going up and down, um, waiting to see the doctor for more answers. So we had been praying that she was having some heart um, fluctuations. And so the tests have been done, and now we got to wait and find out what they have to say about what's going on. Tuesday to get the real one on? Okay. Okay. And it, she'll be on that for a week? Okay. Please be praying, and that's for Whitley. Be praying. Um, Bonnie Hall, um, continue prayers for her great grandson. Um, his heart procedure went well. So. He was the one who was born three months early, if you remember, and um, so they were having all sorts of different procedures to check him and help him to grow properly. So continue to pray for him. Um, I'm just going to echo the praise from Mary Kay earlier about her grandson. Um, that is a praise, to see God does work. Our prayers are heard, and he answers prayers. Um, also, Georgia, she is asking for prayers for Doug. His health has really took a turn for the worse. Um, he's not doing very well, so prayers for Doug. And also be praying for them because during their um, Christmas um, visit with their family, they had a pipe burst here. And from what I heard, it was burst and going for quite some time before one of the neighbors figured it out and was able to call the city to get the water turned off and stuff like that. So that's never a good thing to, to deal with at all. Um, also, my, this one says, my friend's daughter-in-law, Amanda, needs to have gallbladder surgery. She is 36 weeks pregnant. That one's from you? <laughs> or what? That was from me. Okay. Making, uh, that, I didn't have a name, so I was just going to read it. So please, um, prayer for her and her baby. Um, that's um, Amanda and her, her baby. And also, um, this is from Dan and Deb. Please pray for family and friends in the community of Salem. And is that Alabama? Sel or Sel in Selma, Alabama. Um, thankfully, our family is safe, but there has been considerable damage due to the tornado. So be praying for um, the family and friends and that whole community. It's always a tragedy when weather acts like weather and we aren't ready for it. So... Is there anything I may have missed? Yeah, uh, sir, we should remember the Gould family and the uh, Nelson family, the loss of Kelly. And, yep, uh, the Nelson family and the, what's the, the last name of the? Gould? Mm -hmm. uh, that's, they have a different name. Uh, Stetsman. Stetsman's? Yeah. Yeah, the, they were involved in the accident that, that 
bad car accident and the just prayers for not only the family but a lot of the community has been impacted by that as well so all those who have been impacted by that okay Quentin um, Doreen Reed she used to worship here um, and she is our brother's uh, mother and she died last night so keep the grace and the Reed family in your prayers okay and also I wish you'd pray for my kids because their dad died a week ago okay so, so prayers for the for the Reed and the Grace family. Reed and Grace family. For Doreen, and, and then also for my kids. For your for, kids. Because Bob died. Okay, because Bob passed away a week ago. Okay, we will be praying for all those things. Did you get that down, Ashton? All right, there were a whole lot that are here, and I'm not going to be able to remember every single one, but it was all spoken out here for all of us. And so let's go to the Lord, and we're going to go before his throne and ask for his provision. Will you bow with me? Dear Heavenly Father, you have heard each and every single one of these praises and prayer concerns, Father. Many health issues, many who are grieving. Father, we know that you hear us. We know that you answer prayer. And that you are a faithful God who provides everything we need. Not just to execute your will, but even to get through this world and this life. Father, I pray that you will answer these prayers. That, that if it's a health issue, that your hands will be wrapped around them. And that you will use the doctors and as tools in your hands. If it's grief, Father, that you will provide your comfort, your peace as... We struggle through this time of grief because it is a natural part of life, but it's not easy, Father. We need you. For those who have dealt with tornadoes and potentially could have lost everything they've had, Father, remind them that you are their provision. And I pray that you would help them in the rebuilding. You would give them strength and comfort. Father, we just praise you. For answered prayers we see you working there's no arguing that that you are in well in control and that you do answer prayers father we love you so much and it's in jesus's name we pray amen will you please stand in this final song Blessed week. You are dismissed. <laughs>